Well, thank you very much for uh, joining us today for this um, unusual virtual presentation uh, of Stelios Sparaki's books. Um, I'm Stathis Kalivas, uh, I'm a political scientist at the University of Oxford. Uh, and we're joined by Stelios Sparaki, who is the RBC professor of finance at Concordia University in Canada and a fellow of the uh, Royal Academy of Canada and the author of the book we'll be discussing today, and uh, by uh, Gona Van Steen, who is the uh, core ace chair uh, at King's College uh, in London, uh, and also the author of uh, various books, including uh, her latest, a book that speaks to a similar period, a similar time, and some of uh, related problems uh, and issues uh, with um, uh, whose title I always forget. And, uh, here it is. Adoption, memory, and Cold War in Greece, quid pro quo, uh, where kid is actually spelled in an unusual non-Latin way. Uh, we'll be discussing this book, and um, without wanting to take more time at this point, I'll uh, let Stelio say a few things um, and share. Uh, you want to share your presentation? Or yes, yes, I would like okay. to presentation. Okay. So, so let me share the screen. Uh, Okay. Okay. So, as I said, uh, how do we go down? Uh, how do we, all right. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, fellow panelists, and all those who may listen to this panel, thank you for giving me the opportunity to say a few words about the book that's being presented. It's a biography, the first in English of a remarkable woman that has been celebrated in Greece is a national heroine for more than 75 years, even though, as I found out, almost no one in Greece knows what she actually did. Lela Karajani, the World War II heroine whose biography we're discussing, is also almost completely unknown among the English-speaking world, even though she sacrificed her life fighting in the ranks of the British Secret Services. Who was Lela Karajani? Well, let's see a picture of her from the mid 30s, probably. Well, as, as you see, it's a picture of a woman who uh, is a smug bourgeois uh, uh, respectability and prosperity, obviously, uh, you know, attractive and youthful looking, even though by the time she had already had six children, born, given birth to six children. And also, the, uh, obviously, it was taken by a professional photographer. You see how well she's dressed and quaffed. In other words, she looks like what she was, a wealthy matron, Athenian matron. Why was she wealthy? Well, that's an interesting story. She, it was because of her husband, who was a refugee from Smyrna. He had left Smyrna to fight in the Balkan Wars with the Greek army. And he managed in very short time to become a highly successful businessman uh, of, uh, and wholesaler and retailer of pharmaceuticals and cosmetics. They lived in a house in the, what uh, were then the fringes, northern fringes of the city of Athens, which still exists and has been donated to the Greek state by the Karayani family. And also, as far as we know, Lella by the 19... Uh, for, for the, by the 19, uh, by 1941, when the war came, all she was doing was managing her household, which, in, which included quite a bit of a domestic, uh, 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 dom domestic uh, staff. She had, there were at least one, possibly two living language, language teachers, as well as a dressmaker who was devoted to making her the attires, her fashionable attires, and who, as it turned out, uh, became an, one of the, an agent in her resistance group. Let's see the next one. So fast forward about 10 years ahead to the last picture we have of, of, of her. I won't show it because it's too gruesome. It shows a bullet-ridden corpse after her execution on September 8, 1944, at the Haidari Ravine near Daphne, the German officer who had interrogated her under merciless torture for two months was very proud of her capture, 
calling her the great, what the greatest British spy in the Balkans, unquote. That characterization is a little bit of an exaggeration. The title belongs most probably to Yanis Peltekis, the leader of the large apple of the input. But Leila, Leila, nonetheless, was undeniably one of the greatest female spies in all of World War II Europe. In terms of her achievement, she fully matched and properly exceeded Christine Granville and Virginia Hall, the two best known and most uh, competent and active female agents serving with the British Secret Services in World War II, both of whom survived the war. So uh, the, book, uh, uh, the, the book documents the, uh, the uh, a little up, uh, up uh, a little bit. The book documents the evolution of Lela from a prosperous housewife to master spy, which took place between May 10, 1941, when she was accidentally recruited by the resistance, the British-led resistance, and July 10, 1944, when she was arrested. There are no uh, British archival material, there's no British archival material on what she did. Uh, but uh, her, uh, uh, her belonging to the British Secret Services is undeniable because there is a letter uh, co which commands her uh, by Clement Attlee, the, uh, the Prime Minister of, of uh, Great Britain. <laughs> 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 Okay, what happened? Nothing, you can go ahead. Okay, so uh, which uh, commends her for services offered on behalf of Her Majesty, uh, of His Majesty, the King, King George. So, the, so everything that we know comes from Greek archival material, uh, which was from Lela's Bugulina group, as well as several other resistance groups that were extensions of the British Secret Services, like Apollo, with which Lela collaborated. Material has to be handled with care, since the narratives that it contains are often contradictory, almost always self-serving, and omit certain events that would have embarrassed their authors. Mm -hmm. Last but not least, the uh, no, uh, last but not least, the book gives extensive descriptions of the environment in which Lela operated including the structure of the British Secret Services and their internal disputes, as well as the wartime conditions in occupied Greece and the emerging conflicts between the communist-led resistance and its numerous but divided opponents. All these played a role in Lela's uh, uh, resistance career. As we shall see, Lela's remarkable survival skills as a secret agent and leader of an espionage group all of them self-taught, she had no training whatsoever, allowed her to survive almost to the end of the occupation, unlike several other field agents that are described in the book who perished. And the betrayal of Le the rest of Lela came through negligence of others and through no fault of hers. That's all uh, that I have to say. That's, uh, that's what the, sto the story, the biography tells us. And I'll turn to my fellow panelists and look forward to their comments. Thank you very much, Stelio. We'll go to uh, Gonda Van Steen, and I'm going to uh, uh, pull her slide um, in a moment. Yes. Yeah. If, if uh, a listener by the name of Panayoti could mute himself, that, yes. would, uh, yeah. that would be ideal. Thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. It's a pleasure to talk about an exciting new book and to do so in the presence of the author, Stelios Perakis, Stelianos Perakis, and of course, Statis Kalivas, who's currently hosting us. I've made a few slides just to make uh, the presentation easier, but I promise you it's only a, a series of slides meant as a starting point. The meat of our discussion should really be comments and questions with the author, uh, where, of course, we look at your participations, you listeners, that is, and I hope we can move on to that part of our panel pretty soon. Can you see the slide, so yeah, we have the slides in front of us. Thank you. Thank you, Stelio. And I'll give uh, Stati, and I'll give you in, uh, nudges 
when to turn the slide. So you see the beautiful cover of Stelios's book where he names Lela Karayani the improbable heroine. I must say I like that word improbable. We'll need it again. I'm sure he took, he, he took great pains to decide which word to use. Is it reluctant? Is it forgotten? Is it invisible? Is it unlikely? But I like improbable. So whenever I deal with a new book then, that to me opens up an important chapter of Greek history, the 1940s, in fact, a period that I'm more keenly interested in myself as the years go by, and I'm certainly not a specialist, I always think ahead as to how to bring a treasure like this, a new treasure like this, to my students. And, and uh, here I go to the next slide. I came upon a very recent movie, Hollywood, of course, 2019, called A Call to Spy. And as you already guessed, and you can tell from the picture, this is about the women who were hired in the service of the British and thus in the service of the Allied cause to go and spy mainly in France, notice the Eiffel Tower, Nazi occupied France, but also a little bit in the low countries and who are in and of themselves all very improbable heroines. The, the movie stresses this time and again how unlike likely these women are to step up as master spies in this very conflictual environment when the Nazis are terrorizing France. Uh, one is an American woman with a wooden leg, would you know? Another one is a woman of Indian descent who declares herself a Muslim pacifist. And so you immediately see a very feminist, a very multicultural, a very diverse group emerging out of this movie, which is of course very romanticized, but it, it's definitely a good entry point with which to go to my students and say, think of this movie then, think of this movie and this book as opening a window, not on a probable country like France, but on an improbable country like Greece. Now, mind you, Lela Karariani has not had her movie, which is why the contribution of Stelios is all the more important. Next slide then. So Stelios gives us in his book a lot of detail. And I find it productive then for you to kind of focus on thematic questions because I can't do justice to the amount of detail and it absolutely makes no sense for me to repeat it. But Lela Karayani was a three year long Greek spy. Her, her term of service as a spy, if you want, uh, exceeds just three years. And she was tragically executed on the 8th of September in 44. This is always extra tragic if you know just how soon the liberation would follow. She missed the liberation by a few weeks. If she had made it to the liberation, she would have missed, she would have lived and her history and her record could have been very different. Stelius calls her consistently, almost consistently, middle class. I'm going to go a step further and call her pretty wealthy, uh, but civilian. She's older, certainly not fitting the Hollywood profile. She's monolingual. That means only Greek. She is an unlikely profile who pretty much stumbles into a, a, a spy career and, um, and, uh, uh, by accident, but not with reluctance, actually with born leadership qualities that she trains and hones very, very quickly. Stelios rightfully emphasizes just how quickly she goes from inexperienced for all the reasons that he stated that her life has been completely different until now, until 1941, to becoming not only a master spy, but a master spy who actually had some lessons to impart if she would have given the chance to the team in Britain, which by sending women into France actually didn't fare too well. That's a pretty tragic history as um, people may have read and as the movie is actually also made it quite clear. Lela was very advanced, pretty much kind of homeschooled, self-trained, autodidact in spy technique which is all the more remarkable. But I'm also going to ask the question, who is Stelios Perakis? Well, with the same positive connotation to attached to the word improbable, he is the improbable author of the first English language biography of Lela. I say improbable because he's an old, 
whole entire career until now has been one of numbers, academia, finance, and uh, he emerges in a landscape of Second World War Greece and a male author focusing on the forgotten female heroine. He does more than providing just a biography of Lena, as if that weren't important enough. He contextualizes for us the broader context of Greece in World War II, drawing from numerous sources, a remarkable list of sources, a remarkable attention to detail, and also from lived experience, which has been the subject of his previous book. And we go to the next slide. So then what are the challenges for an, an improbable author like Stelios to give us this rich biography of Lella? You need to write to find you need to find the right sources. And they're not just the written records, they're also the unpublished written records. And of course, they need to be checked, cross-checked, checked again with oral sources. Sources of that period um, uh, of time are very uneven, even more so as we move into the civil war. So not only is it finding the sources, researching the sources, but also constantly assessing the sources and striking the right balance in that very conflictual landscape of left, right, every every uh, spot on the spectrum in between extreme left, extreme right, communist, royalist, all of it. And then uh, when, when focusing on a heroine, it cannot become what we call a cardboard heroine. This has to be a personal figure has to emerge who will have all her quali qualifications, but certainly also her shortcomings. I found it very refreshing that Stelios has the courage to say that at some point in her life, Lella was just plain frustrated. And that maybe, maybe one of the reasons she commits to resistance activity is because she wants more in life. Next slide. So along the way then of Stelios offering to us what is a captivating story, we, we get very rich reflections on various topics that I consider important and that I would also be the first to share with my students in, uh, in, in future incarnations of me teaching the Second World War in Greece. I, I find the, the reflections on gender important. Uh, Stelios pays every bit of attention to the fact that Lela is a woman in very much of a man's world. And, uh, and, and let me add, he is a male biographer in that field of Greek history writing. That is, let's admit it, to this day, still very much a man's world. History writing of the 40s is dominated by men. Uh, he also reflects on age. This is an older uh, participant in the resistance. Lella is certainly older than the attractive young woman you see participating in the Hollywood movie. She has her children, she has her family, she has her household to run. You get the sense uh, of Stelios discovering just how important it is to also get the next generation's reflections, the children of Lella reflecting on their mother. Now, mind you, they were involved in resistance activities as well. Lela inspired everybody, uh, but fortunately they survived. And so the intergenerational dimension actually is even extended further when we see that also prior generations are invoked. There are genealogical and very many symbolic links to Bubolina, the heroine from Spetses, and it's no coincidence that the group that Lela leads is called the Bubolina group. Uh, again, making her mark as a woman referring back to that famous heroine of the Greek War of Independence, also coming from a certain belt, also sacrificing it all for a cause. Stelios gives us a lot of reflections also on the making of research and writing, on the process of sorting through sources and researching, on the question what is valid, what is overstated, can it be proven, can it be cross-checked, can we believe it or should we immediately qualify uh, a certain fact by telling us, as he does, honestly, whether it can be ascertained or not. I find that very important, especially in 
uh, a mind landscape like this one is. Moving on. Stelius also reflects on the writing process, and I appreciate that personally a great deal. Uh, having written it all, uh, having written is not the same as having organized it all. How do you organize complex material is a question that is clearly always on his mind. He, he kind of takes the reader by the hand in very many spots to kind of tell us what we need to know, what we need to remember, and why we need to know it at this particular point in the book. So the book cross-references itself quite a bit. I appreciate that because it helps us kind of we doubt which names to retain because they will become all the more important or which names we're interested in learning but if we need them again we can go to the index that's that's good to know because as i said there is a very huge wealth of detail there and 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 the leader is very appreciative of this kind of signposting for all of us uh, leading us through through with the red thread of what is important and then uh, another set of reflections is that um, antithesis that contrasts between the international importance of this story, the British connections, the overarching allied cause of the Second World War, and then in the meantime also the polarizing national landscape in Greece itself. Uh, Lela fought with and for the British Secret Services, the SIS, called the Special Intelligence Service, is also called the Secret Intelligence Service, but she's forgotten in that context. She's not like the, the women active in France who not only got stories written about them, but now also have their movie. There is a paradox here in how little she is known and yet how superficially well known she is and what more there is to be done to make her known in the circles in which she also deserves it, namely international circles and British circles. Now, these reflections on the polarizing national landscape won't surprise you. Stelios is not shy about the fact that the civil war is already in embryonic form notable, noticeable in the, uh, the, the conditions he describes during the occupation. And on. So then Stelios widens and widens our horizon. He takes us to the bigger historical picture and the broader ideological and political landscape of Greece. His epilogue does a lot of work there. He allocates responsibilities without mincing words, and that includes blame, innocence. He calls up the ghosts of very destructive suspicions. And he even tells us that Lela was perhaps a little too trusting and that um, uh, for all the skills she, she had developed, her very humane trust perhaps in people who couldn't be trusted is what ultimately caused her demise. In some then, the author uses Lela's biography as a very useful lens to help us reassess the Greek resistance in the Second World War and to already reflect on the onset and development of the Civil War. And he packs all this much in 360 pages with a timeline, which I found very helpful, with a bibliography, with a list of abbrevi abbreviations, with some very exclusive pictures, and also with a very excellent index that uh, is very valuable. As soon as you start needing something again, you can go right back. And on to my second last slide. All right then. So as bonuses, Stelios is very open about Lela's work for the Greek Jews uh, and, and fits that part of Greece's experience of the Second World War into the larger Holocaust history. Here again, Lela is far from a reluctant heroine. She's a born leader and she has been duly recognized as one of the righteous among nations by Yad Vashem through the actions and on the initiative of Stelios, which is very uh, praiseworthy. One of the other bonuses is that we learn a lot about spy activities, sabotage attempts, 
SKPs, escape routes, networks, communications, the functioning of wireless, we really get a very rich, uh, almost like uh, landscape full of sets and props of the Second World War. We also become aware of very fluid and shifting alliances, contacts with the security battalions, for instance, which become plenty controversial afterwards. But, but Stelios is aware of the fact that it's easier to come to conclusions with the knowledge of hindsight that in the heat of the moment itself, knowledge and communications are acquired gradually, knowledge emerges slowly and needs to make its way through the thick of what is lack of communication and confusion. So Stelios reflects on history making, but also on memory making processes. What has come to us from that period in time? Who has dominated the narrative of World War II and especially of the Civil War? And do we need to put in the touches of necessary correctives? And one last thing I appreciate very much in the work, Stelius points to areas of further research. Of course, we can't cover it, cover it all, but Stelius tells us, for instance, this is a person who is very worthy of a biography. This is an area somebody should really tackle. And I find that very helpful, since we are all constantly looking for good topics that our students could undertake. This is these are very useful pointers. Last slide. Okay then, my main questions and comments then uh, focus on the following. How do we make sure that the political strands of World War II, which are always so male-centered and so centered on spectacular armed confrontations, I mean it all three, spectacular armed and confrontations as opposed to unseen, unarmed, contributions, how do we make sure that those don't take over again? Lela's biography is a safeguard now in place to kind of counter that uh, mainstream narrative, but what other safeguards can we put in place? And then given Stelios' successful record working to get Lela recognized in the Jewish community in the context of the Holocaust, what would, would it take to give her the deserved recognition from the British? Thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, for this uh, very rich uh, and very uh, comprehensive description of the book, which actually makes my task a little bit redundant. I'm not going to repeat uh, most of the things that you've said, uh, Gonda. Uh, what I would like to say is just a few words about, again, Stelios and about uh, the book itself, uh, which, by the way, uh, is going to appear in a Greek translation um, in a few months. So there will be further discussion uh, once the book reaches the Greek public. Um, so let me start with a few words about Stelios, whom I have known now for uh, almost uh, 20 years, if not more. Um, Stelios is very, very much an accomplished economist, uh, and he's not undertaking um, a historical excursion uh, without understanding what it takes, and just because he's left his field and, and he feels he wants to have a hobby, so to speak, uh, on the contrary, he has pursued um, uh, the story of the Greek 1940s in a very consistent and very focused way, starting uh, in the past with the, uh, a book that started as a family memoir, but also became a very profound reflection uh, on the Greek Civil War, the ghosts uh, of Plaka Beach. Um, and throughout the process generated uh, new knowledge for himself, approached people, found a couple of very interesting, uh, as you said, one of the pointers for, for direction and decided to implement uh, one of them. Uh, he started it, he stopped it, life took his, its own course, but he never abandoned it. And, and I find that very inspiring because uh, as, you, as we all know, um, the lives of scholars are full of abandoned projects. Uh, so I find his consistency and drive uh, to be extremely inspiring for all of us. Um, so. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to say, he, even though he's, he's not a professional historian, uh, he actually takes the job very seriously, as you said. He doesn't uh, leave any stone um, unturned. Uh, he uh, 
reads very widely, is able to synthesize and to write in a way that um, I would say would put a lot of economists to shame, because as we all know, economists are not famous for their ability to write in a comprehensive, in, in, in a comprehensible way. So uh, this box is ticked as well. Let me say a few things about um, the person, Lela Karayani, because I think uh, in line with what Wanda said as well, uh, she's a character that brings in much larger issues. Um, she's in complete contrast, I would say, with how uh, the great majority of people in Greece who care about history, but also a lot of historians, uh, tend to think about the 1940s. Uh, and I'd like to draw this uh, in terms of a set of contrasts. So uh, one contrast, which is very obvious, and I think Onda covered very well, is the gender contrast. She's a woman operating in a man's world, and the history of the resistance uh, and the history of the 1940s primarily, especially as we move to leadership positions, uh, is the story of men. The second contrast is that uh, she creates and leads uh, a very small urban cell, but the story of the Greek resistance is a story of mass resistance, of mass processes, in which individuals, uh, in a sense, uh, acquire their ability to ask through collective action. And this is the second contrast. Here we have a person who is able to make a difference through sheer um, individual action rather than collective action. And that very often uh, is uh, given as an example of how not to act, that the collectivity and collective action uh, should be remembered more than individual actions. Even when we focus on individuals, uh, they tend to be heroes acting uh, in a collective fashion. That's a very different story here because of the needs of the particular um, action. Uh, when I was... Uh, a small child, unlike many of, of, of the children, not of my generation, probably the generation before of me, but I happened at some point to inherit a trove uh, of um, children's book, books, uh, which I read in the summer in a very boring uh, summer camp in the island of Salamina, I remember. So I was very bored with all the activities. I started reading those, uh, those books. They were written by a prolific Greek author of, of uh, Greek teenage, books named uh, Steus Animoduras, and the title was Peggy Fantasma, uh, the child, the ghost child. Uh, he also picked a character that was very unlikely, uh, basically a teenager, who is able to sheer uh, uh, dare um, uh, to be a successful spy during the Second World War, countering the Germans. He has a sidekick named Spithas, who is a is a fat boy who that cannot control uh, his hunger, which makes it a very difficult case in a period of uh, mass famine. Uh, and he also has uh, a woman a, a woman friend who, who, with whom he shares a romantic relationship named Katerina. So the three of them uh, became the heroes of an entire generation of Greek children uh, fighting against the Germans um, during the Second World War. Uh, and this is a story, um, uh, and it, which is very interesting in and of itself because Anemoduras was himself, I think, leftist, but nevertheless chose to emphasize this character operating in the shadows, the, chi the, the child spy. Uh, when um, uh, the dictatorship fell uh, and uh, Greek historians brought the, I would say, marginalized memories of the Greek left to the forefront, uh, one of the casualties was the experience uh, described in a romanticized fashion uh, in the ghost child, but also the experiences of people like Lela Karagiani, who by not being easily classified uh, in the political spectrum, by not being members of the left, by not being members of mass organizations, didn't really fit very well uh, in the narrative. So we have a very interesting paradox. Lela Karagiani, as Stelio says, is, is known as a name. Uh, she has a statue. Uh, there is also a street in Kipseli named uh, Lela Karagiani Street. But if you ask anyone who she is and what she did, they cannot really tell you. So she's a sort of invisible uh, heroine of the period. A and also people would not be able to tell you much about the type of activities in which uh, she engaged for all those reasons. So I think the book um, is really uh, a potentially important uh, intervention in bringing back this kind of unusual experience in, uh, in the sense if I want to use a more fashionable vocabulary, Demarginal, demarginalizing 
uh, a hearing who has become marginalized because of the confluence in a sense of uh, historical trends uh, and, uh, and, you know, um, uh, revisions of how we understand the past, which are perfectly natural in history. History is constantly evolving uh, a process of reinterpreting the past. Uh, and bringing also to the fore the dimension uh, of resistance, which was not, um, as Wanda said, uh, an armed activity in the countryside or a social movement uh, in the city, but you know, but it's part of this this other dimension, the sabotage, uh, spy cells, um, and what is particularly remarkable in that story is the fact uh, that this was a woman who was, uh, although amateur. Uh, in what she undertook, not a professional by any means. She was deadly serious uh, about what she was doing. Uh, she paid uh, uh, for it with her life. She didn't do it to gain some notoriety. She really got into the process, did it uh, with incredible um, ability uh, and deserves the kind of recognition that, um, that she, she never got because even when she was recognized, she was recognized as a sort of cardboard figure, not as uh, a full person. Uh, so I think these are uh, some of the uh, very interesting contributions on top of the contribution, which is adding a piece of the puzzle, which is the Greek 1940s, which is really um, a mosaic full of contradictory uh, dimensions, uh, rather than uh, a simple black and white kind of uh, movie, uh, a sort of Hollywood, in a sense, movie with, you know, very clearly delineated heroes. Um, and anti-heroes. Um, and um, I'm very keen to see how uh, the Greek edition of the book uh, will be received and discussed. Uh, and um, I'd be very interested to participate in the general discussion that will follow that. So I'm going to stop here, uh, give the floor to Stelios to see whether he has something to say in way of response. And, and then we can perhaps uh, take a few questions from uh, the people who are following um and uh take it from there so stay you the floor well, is yours what is there to say except thank you to both of you i, mean, I feel very flattered i don't deserve this flattery i've i've conceived myself as a researcher i have been doing research since the mid 1960s when i started to work on my doctorate in berkeley and research follows the same if you like more or less path across disciplines you have to be rigorous able to justify everything you do, and also, last but not least, be able to state clearly and more or less eloquently what you find. Now, the eloquence is not natural to economists, as Staffy said, in, but I was fortunate uh, to be married for 49 years to a literary scholar whom I lost to cancer in 2018, lung cancer, and so we lived together, we were, it was a 52 year old love affair in which, of course, I got a lot about literature and literary writing, about poetry, about uh, from her. And the first writing that I did that, uh, that Staffis uh, mentioned, uh, she read it very carefully. She pointed out where I should tone down th things down, where I should Right, uh, so I think some of it rubbed off in the second in which she was not there. Last but not least, she was also Jewish, and that's what uh, justifies my particular interest in that side. It was, as you understand, a mixed marriage, very unpopular to both sides, both the Greek and the Jewish, but we persisted and we won in the end because we stayed together and very happily for all this time. That's why it's dedicated partly uh, mm -hmm. to her memory, but it also left me with a lifelong interest in the Holocaust. And, and this, after all, you know, it, it hits you in the gut when you read about the Holocaust and you look at the woman next to you and you figure of her being shipped uh, as a little girl to the death camps. So that's the reason I was interested and the first thing I did when I saw what Lela Karayan had done was try to make her recognized. I collected the testimonies and, to, and went to Yad Vashem because I think Greece deserved this recognition and Lela deserved this recognition.
definition of self. That's all I have to say. Again, thank you for your comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tedio. Any questions from uh, uh, our very small audience? Uh, I remind you that this is being recorded. We're going to probably edit it uh, and upload it, but you're very welcome to ask questions uh, to Stelios about this endeavor. Uh, let me know if you do. Uh, most of you are muted, but um, if you're- I'm not sure you... how to let you know. Okay. <laughs> um, the floor is yours. That was all very, very interesting, uh, but it left me anyway with more questions than answers. And I thought there, there may be two reasons for that. Um, one is that the evidence about what Leila Karayani was actually doing as a spy uh, may be thin. I don't know about that, perhaps, perhaps you'd be able to answer. Um, and I suppose the second question is, um, how does one supplement what we have heard and the evidence that has been put before us? And um, one way of doing this might be to hear a little about the context within which Lele Karayani, Karayani worked and the, the Bubulina um, um, element in her, her life as a spy. Can you tell us a little bit? Uh, uh, gladly. Well, let me put it this way about the evidence. We, ha we have, first of all, it is very clear that Lela was embedded into the British Secret Services, and she formed a node in the communications network uh, between the headquarters of the SIS, which were near Smyrna on, in, in Chesme, and the and Athens, and occupied Athens. She was a crucial node because we have repeated testimonies from many sources of her receiving and distributing uh, or uh, communicate wireless equipment and also uh, sabotage equipment to uh, agents and saboteurs. So obviously she was connected. She, she got this, this thing from somebody and she got instructions to deliver them to other people. So she was very much a component of that network. And also what impressed me, we have evidence that uh, her rank was rising because she started as an MI9, uh, or in, in other words, the, the, the intelligence service that dealt with escapes uh, and hosting of escapees, very clearly. That's, and that's the only thing that described by the Greek biographers, but that took up very little of her time because it, uh, you know, she, it took only about five and a half months out of a th more than three year uh, career. As soon as uh, from mid, uh, uh, from April 1942 on, she was in bed, we see her with testimony. First of all, she was sending agents uh, pilfering uh, uh, written documents from the uh, secret uh, German military intelligence, where obviously the British have plant had planted, if you like, uh, people. And bringing them to Lela, the, her agent, the agent was a German woman, brought them to Lela, who in turn sent them somewhere. We don't know where, we don't know how she sent them, but we know that this went on for quite a while. We also know that she was in contact with German, if you like, who anti Nazi Germans, who also gave her uh, documents and information. And last but not least, uh, we know that she had planted uh, people in the anti-guerrilla uh, unit, Brandenburg Division in, in, uh, in, in Greece, uh, which that was late when the armed resistance was fighting, was fighting and she had planted uh, people in, the, in this anti-guerrilla group who were very valuable and very dangerous what they did 
And he fortunately survived and gave us a full account. I can say many more. You know, all, all of the book is about tracing this kind of uh, networks and uh, avenues and, uh, and information sources from which we form a coherent picture of that. And I admit I had to use some judgment which ones to discard and which ones didn't sound very plausible. For instance, there is somewhere, there is a testimony that says that Lela received the wireless uh, equipment and she said, I'm going to send it to a British uh, major, uh, British major or colonel in help, who is in near Carpenici. Well, at the time she received it, there was no British major in Carpenici. So it was obviously giving deceptive information. She was lying. And the reason she was lying is because that we know that exactly at that time, the, she, the, there was a famous saboteur named Ivanov who received the wireless equipment from Lela Karayani. So obviously she wanted to hide the true destination of the wireless equipment. That's how you put two and two. I, I'm sorry, that's all I can do you know, with the nature of the information. You just put it, piece it together and, and find from various sources what was true, what was probable, and what was the best guess. Well, did I answer your question? You will have to unmute yourself, uh, Michael, if uh, you want to reply, but uh, anyone who wants to jump in uh, or wants to ask a question, please unmute yourself and, and go ahead. Yes, I've tried to unmute it. It should be working. Yes. Around. Thank you very much indeed. That goes a very long way to answering the sort of um, the question which I put to you. And um, my next step will be to, to buy, buy your book. Interest. Thank you. Thank you. Any other uh, question? If, if there isn't any other question, I guess we can conclude our, uh, our, uh, our Zoom session, uh, which was intended as, a, as an appetizer, shall I say, uh, for what there is to come. We hope to host you at some point in the UK in person, Stelio, for a, happy to come and... or a discussion. Uh, you, you are, among other things, an, indop an unstoppable traveler uh, <laughs> rounding the world. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm sure we can do that. And certainly, I, I would say I'm, I'm very much looking forward uh, to a proper in-person presentation uh, of the Greek translation of your book when it comes out. Um, I'm a traveler, but I also call to your attention, well, there is an, an age issue, which Will not won't be disclosed, although if you buy the book, you obviously will find out what it is. So it's getting harder and harder, but for it's worth doing. I think a, a presentation in the London is something that needs to be done, okay? Because after all, Lela Garayani gave her life for England, basically, no, no, not for Greece, obviously, but, but it was uh, the, she was fighting in the ranks of the British. And she was a fanatical Anglophile. Two of her children were named Byron and Nelson, which are not exactly common names for yeah. boys in the Greece of the 1920s. But at any rate, so that's, I'll, I'll be happy to. And I'll be happy to go wherever you want me to, to present uh, within reason, of course. Uh, health is, of course, the primary consideration. Thank you very much. I really am touched uh, and very flattered by your comments. As I said, I don't deserve all of them. Some of them must go to my deceased wife who made me, if you like, a competent writer of nonfiction. Well, thank you very much, Stelio. Uh, thank you. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Wanda, for your excellent- a Pleasure. Uh, thank you all. Uh, and thank you very much to our small audience for uh, dropping in today. Um, and hopefully we'll be back with more. Yeah. Uh, also and I, I, and I, I shouldn't be disclosing that, but Stelio has another idea for a book, uh, another biography in mind, which I'm not going to say more, but uh, given yeah. his uh, stamina and his skills, I'm very much looking to that as well. We'll see. 
<laughs> so thank you very much, everyone, and uh, looking forward to seeing you in person as well. Thank you. Bye-bye. Stay Bye. well. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you.